George, in my obsession to understand the nature of existence, uh, I like to ask the question, what exists? In other words, we know this dead bench exists, the tree exists, but in terms of the most fundamental categories that are non-reducible to the other categories, where do we go at bedrock? And, you know, typical answers are uh, physicalists or naturalists, we just have the phys laws of physics, quantum physics, whatever's below that, uh, people who believe in God, whatever God category, etc. You have what I think is a different category called possibility spaces yeah. as something that really exists, and I want to understand that. Well, I regard possibility spaces as the deep structure of the universe, and there are two kinds. There are physical ones and there are abstract ones. So let, let's take the physical ones first. Um, in physics, we talk about phase spaces, which are possible motions of objects. In quantum physics, we talk about Hilbert spaces. Those are possible states of a quantum system. So those are possibility states for those systems. Now, in biology, there's a fantastic discussion by Andreas Wagner in his book, Arrival of the Fittest, in which he talks about possibility spaces for biological systems. And he talks about them explicitly as eternal, unchanging possibilities. They were the same before the universe started. They are the same now and they will be the same ever. He has four categories. He has um, uh, his phenotype genotype maps related to proteins, related to um, uh, signal transduction networks, to gene regulatory networks, and to metabolic networks. And these are all based in the way that molecules interact with each other and um, control the way that life exists. Now, those possibilities, possibilities for different kinds of met metabolic systems, pot of possibilities for different types of proteins. Those have been the same sitting there ever since the start of the universe. And what has happened is as evolution has taken place, various of those have been realized in living animals and some of them haven't. But what has happened here in the physical world is made possible. Well, it's, it's constrained, if you like, by this possibility space. So I believe that possibility space exists in an abstract platonic sense and at a certain level is more real than the transitory world in which we exist because that is timeless and eternal and this stuff comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a radical idea. You know, as, as, peop as people say about all these questions uh, about existence, consciousness, and why is it something rather than nothing, it's not that your idea is too, ra is too radical, it's that is it radical enough? Yep. And I think, I think this qualifies as radical enough. I'm not sure it's right, but <laughs> we'll, let's explore it. Let's, yeah. let's... Well, okay. Um, Let's go just a little bit further there. There's, there's a possibility space for these microbiology stuff. Out of that arises the possibility spaces for animals. And people like Waddington have talked about the evolutionary landscape, which is the possible animals which could come into existence. And some of them have come into existence and other haven't. This has a subspace of animals with consciousness and then a smaller subspace of animals with self-consciousness. So the possibility of self-consciousness is built into a possibility space and is part of the deep structure of the cosmos from this viewpoint. Okay, now is your possibility spaces uh, different than uh, the, the, the all possibilities in a you know David Lewis sense of the modal realism that everything anything that you could possibly well, imagine or thing, well, everything there is. Well, you see, it's not. The, I'm talking about physical possibility spaces so this isn't anything you could possibly imagine this is anything which could come into existence given the laws of physics as they okay. do exist. Or given the laws of physics as they currently exist. Yeah. Now that would equally apply to rocks and trees and anything. Planets, galaxies. Yeah I mean it, it doesn't have to be animate objects. No, it's no, no, anything. No, no, no. Yeah. Now the other category of possibility spaces is abstract ones and the one which is most obvious to mathematicians is the space of mathematical possibilities. And ma many mathematicians are Platonists because they explore um, prime numbers, for instance. They find prime numbers have certain patterns. They don't invent those patterns, they find them. Um, the square root of two is irrational. People didn't invent that fact, they find it. So this is again a timeless, un eternal, unchanging fact. You can re-express that as saying it is impossible for the square root of two to be rational. So again, this is a possibility space of mathematical possibility. Right, right. So, so that's a limited one. You can't, uh, there's no possibility space for, for the square root of two to be a rational number. Yeah. So correct. that's excluded. Yeah. Now, 
Well, when, once one started this line of argument, it's very fruitful. You can go on. One of the ones I like is the space of possible algorithms. We teach computer science classes. We teach our, our, our students sorting pr processes, and there's different kinds. There's bubble sort, heap sort, quick sort, etc., etc. You see, now, a computer science on any other planet in the universe will find the same sorting process, because these are the only possible logical ways of sorting. Sure. No, I, I like that. I, yeah. I, I like that. Um, you know, I, I'm jumping far ahead, but I, I have to ask this, because um, it, for someone who is a theist, yeah. if, if possibility spaces are that, are that strong, both in the physical sense and in the abstract, especially yeah. the abstract, sense, that sounds to be a higher order of existence than God would be. That is a very deep kind of question, and I'm going to plead the fifth amendment <laughs> on that one. It may be that God, if he exists, she exists, created those possibility spaces, or maybe he is constrained by them. That I don't know. <laughs> but l l let me take the two most important other ones. There's a possibility space for thoughts, and this is governed by the seemingly platonic attitude in this statement, you can only think a thought if it is possible to think it. Actually, that's a very deep statement. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so we can only Actually, have... the, the trivial are very deep. <laughs> no, it's, very, it's, it's very deep because this possibility of the discussion that we are happening now has been there since the start of the universe. It's been realized at this moment, but that possibility has always been there. The, the crunch issue is that part of that possibility of... Oh, by the way, the fact that you can think about it doesn't mean it exists in reality. Part of the subspace of thoughts is fairies and dragons. It doesn't right. mean they exist. Right. Part of that subspace is gods. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it exists. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Okay. Now, but what does exist, a subspace of that space, is the space of ethics. It's the space of thinking about right and wrong. And so, in this sense, it's possible to think about what is right and wrong because it's part of this possibility space of thoughts. In that sense, the concept of ethics is built into the very foundations of the universe. Now, I think that is a very powerful statement. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not. Uh, is is that right? Because what you're saying is possibility because of any thought. So I can I can think bad thoughts, and that's been a possibility space. How do you know they're bad thoughts? Um, well, I mean, we're getting into whether, whether, whether morality is absolute or relative. Yes, there's two separate issues. The first issue is it's possible to think about moral thoughts. It's possible to think about good and bad. The second thing is a much deeper step. Is there a metric on those? Is there, in fact, absolute statement about what is right and what is wrong? Now, I, I maintain that anybody has to agree that there is a possibility of thinking moral thoughts. Yeah, that's right. Where, where, the, uh, where the disagreement can come is, are there absolute stands of right and wrong? And in other words, does that possibility, is there a space of moral realism in which right, right. some things are absolutely right and some right. things are wrong? Now, I personally, together with a lot of other philosophers, take the position that there is such a moral absolute statement, some things are absolutely wrong, like the Holocaust was wrong, period. There's nothing more to say about it. But other people take relativist positions of various kinds, uh, and, and this is where we can have some agreement or disagreement. So I'm drawing a sharp distinction. I think the possibility of thinking about ethics is there, period. The possibility of saying what is actually good and bad, I think it's there, but this is where I'm stepping across a boundary, and I, I, I cannot justify it in logical terms, I just say this is what I believe. 